Welcome to another episode of Islamba today on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hamza Rafadassan. Today's question is going to be on the question of law and the accessibility of law and the applicability of law for all segments of society. When we talk about the developing world in general, there have been lots of complaints from average citizens that they are not able to actually access law firms and they're not able to access the right, um, you know, uh, the lawyers and to try and make sure that they can plead their case. And we're talking about a society in Pakistan where honor killings are on the rise, there's uh, women harassment in the workplaces as well, and there are all sorts of stuff that actually happens to people where, um, you know, speedy justice is actually needed. So how to actually tackle that particular problem, that is something that we're going to be discussing today. I have with me senior advocate Ms. Siva Farooq. She has over 20 years of legal advisory experience and has held some very important positions during her career as the head of legal uh, you know, a head of legal to the Wafaki Bothism, which basically means the federal ombudsman. She was also the legal advisor to the ICRC and the United Nations. And she was also legal advisor to NEPRA and legal consultant to UK Aid. She's an expert in the area of international humanitarian law. And that's exactly what we're going to be discussing with her today as part of the show and uh, human rights as well and engages with international organizations. Since 2014, Seba operates her own law firm, namely SNS Law Associates, which has a full service firm offering specialized legal services in a range of civil and criminal matters. Mr. Bafaro, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you, Hamza. I'm so happy to be on your show today. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I hope you're doing well, too. It's an absolute honor for me to have you on the show, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, most of our viewers in Hawaii and across the West Coast would be pretty much, you know, inspired by what you have to say today. So, Ms. Sibba, let's start off with a basic question here. And when we talk about the basic question, how difficult is it for average Pakistani citizens or average citizens in the developing world, quote unquote, to access law firms? Okay, Hamza, the thing is that uh, Pakistan is a huge country and uh, this side of the world is heavily populated. We have a great disparity between the rural and the urban population. So this answer is going to be different for, for what access of justice is like to people in the villages and for or for what access to justice is like for women uh, for people in the uh, big cities okay. i do not think actually in uh, present day pakistan it is very difficult it is not very difficult um in the past about 5 years we have seen uh, increasing litigation we have seen uh, people reach out to alternate um resolution methods, such yeah. as the federal law ombudsman. Um, we see people speaking for their rights. We see uh, minorities and um, um, women and uh, the transgender community. We see, see them out. We see them protesting. We see them reaching out. We see petitions. So uh, not as difficult as maybe it was 10 years back. The situation yeah. is definitely improving. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. So when we talk about, uh, you mentioned women, and you know, uh, we talk about women in countries such as Pakistan. They tend to be some of the most deprived segments of the society. We're talking about literacy rates, which are actually a lot lower as compared to their male counterparts, and their ability to access justice has also been impeded to a large extent. How much do you think that's true? And uh, number two, what sort of impediments do women actually encounter when they're accessing justice? Okay. Uh, so Hamza, yes. Absolutely true. The the gender, um, what you would say, disparity is yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. Um, the kind of access that a, a man has in this society compared to what a woman has in very many dis different areas is, um, uh, is, is very different. There is a big gap in that. Having said that, uh, I would say that the law has been improving for women. Um, let's look at some things like uh, the there is now a law called the Workplace Protection of Women at the Workplace mm -hmm. Against Harassment. So that mm -hmm. law came in 2010. Uh, initially, when a law is, um, you know, passed through parliament, it takes some time for it to uh, develop and uh, get known within society and for people to employ that law and for it to actually become useful. So it took about, I would say, actually about a decade for that to happen. But now women are very well aware of how to protect themselves from harassment at the workplace. 
that is one of the things. Now there are domestic violence laws in all the provinces. Um, some years back, even those didn't exist. Actually, women were not even aware that they could raise their voice against uh, domestic violence. That is also changing. Media, as you know, in Pakistan has become, um, uh, it, it's a huge tool. You yourself have been associated with media. You are right yeah. now as well. And you know that uh, media, especially social media, has reached out deep into our society, down to the villages. So um, women are more aware of their rights uh, compared to what they were some years back. However, there are still very many challenges that women face. Um, in terms of their rights to inheritance and property, that is one of the main things all over the country. You know, mm -hmm. women are denied that it is something very uh, commonplace and it's a common practice that, you know, the, the girls in the family are asked to write off their property in favor of their brothers or their husbands or um, any male relatives. And they do not do not even think that it is a right to protest against that. Um, right to education. When a household has a, um, a son and a daughter, they prefer to send the son to school and they choose not to send the daughter and she's married off. Um, uh, 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 right to, uh, you know, r r rights over their own bodies, rights to decide whether they want to have children or how many children they want to have or whether they do not want to have children anymore. So these are some things that are still huge challenges. They are there. Mm -hmm. um, civil society, uh, the legal fraternity, um, you know, uh, as such, the educated segment of society is fighting against it, is trying to raise awareness, but we are still far uh, you know, we still have a long way to go before we reach that ideal state that we would want. Okay, you mentioned gender disparity. I would also like to highlight the rural-urban divide. So when you talk about women who actually hail from tribal society, or societies where you could say access to justice is basically limited with the limited amount of facilities that are actually available, so do you think it's more easier for a woman to access law firms and lawyers and, you know, competent judges within uh, urban centers such as Islamabad, Lahore, Karachi, Peshawar, as compared to maybe in Turbat or, you know, the erstwhile Fatah region, the NMDs, for example, you talk about Momand Agency or Oryx Agency. So do you think that it's more of an urban-rural divide as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. A hundred percent. The rural-urban divide is huge. Um, I cannot, uh, even, even so much so, in, uh, there's a divide between certain cities as well. So the yeah. shower is very close to us. We're sitting in Islamabad. There's going to be a big difference between the way a woman lives her ordinary life or has access to justice in Islamabad and India compared to one in Peshawar. When I go to Peshawar, um, I, I cannot even walk the streets the way that I am right now. I'm going to cover my head so that I don't uh, stand out as the only woman within, um, with an uncovered head. And, that is going, and that's intimidating because nobody else is like that over there. R likewise, um, in the in the far out Fata regions, you cannot you are not going to see women on the streets, let alone being able to walk into law firms or walking to the courts and uh, seeking justice for themselves. So you're absolutely hundred percent right. But inside Islamabad, in Karachi, in Lahore, um, I do not think that uh, access to justice for women is very hard. Yes, at the family front, they may face hurdles when their family is not supportive of them to seek uh, justice. However, there are very many female lawyers now in all the courts. There are very many female lawyers in law firms. Uh, for a woman who wants to say um, um, seek her right to divorce or wants to apply for wants the guardianship of her children, right? Fully that those that should be with her, or a woman who wants her uh, right over her inheritance. It's not hard for her to seek out a female lawyer or a lawyer as such um, to fight her case. It's not that hard in the urban setting. Okay, okay. So, I mean, we're also talking about, you know, gender divides as far as, uh, you know, access to justice is concerned. I think one of the main areas uh, that uh, needs to be shed light on, and something that Pakistan does not necessarily get the credit that it deserves, is the you know is the concept of the alternate dispute mechanism so when we talk about the alternate dispute mechanism um this was basically passed by the parliament and the parliament basically said okay for women who are actually living in societies where access to justice is impeded we're talking about situations where maybe the jirga system or maybe a system that you know the societies actually accept 
as mechanisms for dispensing justice, they can actually be taken uh, into the forefront and other dispute mechanisms can be taken. Conservative. Do you think that the ultimate dispute uh, resolution mechanism that is actually in place for places such as N the NMDs or places in Balochistan, is it effective enough? Or do you think that access to courts or high courts or local courts or district courts or even the Supreme Court for that matter, that needs to be secured for greater gender uh, parity? There are, uh, Hamza, there are uh, very many um, aspects that have to be kept in mind when talking about uh, alternate dispute um, camps. Number one, they're necessary uh, because the main problem in Pakistan is the huge pendency of cases with courts. The courts are overburdened, have uh, such a huge backlog that uh, the saying justice delayed, justice denied applies 100% in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, people wait a number of years for their cases to reach a finality or for them to get a decision or for them to get some justice. So uh, that means that the, the courts are having a hard time to handle all the cases that they have. This is where the alternate dispute, alternate uh, dispute resolution and mechanisms are very, very important. Having said that, you mentioned jirkas. I, for one, uh, do not think that the jirkas are competent enough to understand the protection of fundamental rights. Okay. Every citizen of Pakistan has a right that their rights under the constitution should be protected. Now, who can do that? Uh, the, the justice for the protection of fundamental rights can be dispensed through people who know about those fundamental rights, are educated in those fundamental rights, who have some judicial training. So the Jirka system is not reliant on that. Jirka system is reliant on culture and tradition. Culture and tradition for very long has, um, has violated the rights of uh, women as such um, the, and has allowed the denial of their fundamental rights for very, very long. So if we keep relying on those ancient and primitive uh, methods, then there is no hope for the fundamental rights of women to be protected or the fundamental rights of the minorities to be protected. Our constitution makes it very clear, especially in its uh, uh, provisions, that there needs to be special laws in place for the protection of women. And laws are essential. So I support alternate dispute um, mechanisms, mm -hmm. but the likes of the Ombudsman Institution or the likes of uh, other quasi-judicial institutions that are actually educated in the laws of the country and uh, so that there can be some uniformity in the application of laws. I do not support the jirga systems or the traditional cultural systems that are, uh, that are actually built on biases. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I, so, I, I'm, I'm, I'm able to make you understand. Yeah. No. No. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's a fair enough point because when you you need alternate dispute mechanisms, but you also need to make sure that uh, the applicability of law and the provision of justice needs to be provided by the traditional pillars of providing justice. For example, the courts. You're talking about the, the federal ombudsman that you rightly spoke about. So I think that's a fair enough point. We'll speak about international humanitarian law in a minute, but when we talk about minority rights in Pakistan. And we're talking about Christians who are actually targeted, and when they actually get to the courts, the uh, justice is not dispensed. You have a Sikh population, a small one, but a very significant one, uh, pr uh, predominantly in Punjab and in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And when attacks take place against them, they also have complained that uh, dispensation of justice for our communities tends to be very different from the predominantly Muslim majority population. So, um, and that that's a trend which we also see in India. We also have seen it in Sri Lanka and also in Bangladesh as well. But how do you how do you overcome such a problem where every citizen, as you rightly mentioned, in the Constitution is somebody who has fundamental uh, human rights, regardless of his religion, ethnicity, caste, creed, whatever. But at the same time, it's important for them to have the same, uh, you could say, dispensation of justice that would be awarded to a majority population, uh, a member of the majority population, for that matter. How do you bridge that divide when it comes to minorities? You've spoken about uh, women. What about minorities? So um, when I speak about minorities, um, uh, I think women, um, the trans community, um, the religious segments such as Christians and uh, people from other religions inside Pakistan, they all fall in the uh, minority segment. 
uh, but of course, religious minorities uh, largely as well. Uh, how do you correct that divide? Um, only by strengthening the judicial system. That is the the only way. Um, and and to strengthen the judicial system and to get just decisions at the end of the day, you also have to strengthen the law enforcement system. So what's where the problem stems from in Pakistan, Hamza, is because um, uh, the the investigation stage is very largely corrupted, is very slow, is very defective. So when uh, the your, your case, your litigation from where it stems, there is a huge reliance on the law enforcement to ensure that the investigation is done in a speedy and in a correct manner. That is not done so in most cases, and especially in the cases of various minorities. So when they do not get justice and fair treatment at the very first step, then they are compromised in the judicial system. So it's very important to reorganize this judicial system. It is very important to ensure that the investigative stage is very well done. It is very important to ensure that there is training of um, the various tires. So there needs to be training of the uh, law enforcement. There needs to be training of the legal fraternity. And there needs to be training of the judiciary to ensure that there is uniformity and to ensure that it is all done in a speedy matter and manner and there needs to be a um, certain cases need to be diverted to the alternate dispute uh, mechanisms that yeah. are very functional and well in place in the country so that the burden is a um, little bit reduced on the judiciary and they're able to handle cases in a speedy manner. So I think uh, it's it's all very interconnected. Uh, it's all, all very interconnected at a very institutional level. Until we get, have all these institutional changes, we're not be going, going to be able to solve the problem for anyone, let alone the minorities. So, uh, in your experience with the federal ombudsman or the Wafaki um, there have been many cases which have, you know, come to the fore. And how, how do you rate the functionality of the Wafaki Mothazib, which is actually located in Islamabad and it's very far away from the periphery, where many such horrendous cases actually take place against the minorities? You talk about women, you talk about the deprived segments of the society. How would you rate the performance of the federal ombudsman? Okay, so now the federal ombudsman has regional offices almost all over Pakistan and has a reach into the districts. So they have okay. these, um, like, uh, they, they, they have uh, they have these judicial sort of uh, what we call uh, uh, open kacheri sort of thing okay. uh, in Pakistan. So they reach out into the districts and they offer a speedy resolution of the cases. And how I would rate them, they're superb. Okay. Because it's the only institution where within 60 days you get a decision. Uh, their mandate is limited to the extent of uh, complaints against the maladministration of government. Right, right. Now, these can be any kind of complaints from a, um, an incorrect electricity bill to um, uh, corruption at the hands of a government official, to a complaint against the police, to a complaint against um, the uh, gas or electricity or the water or the telephone or the educational authorities. Any government department where the government has a share is falls under the mandate of the Ombudsman Secretary. And the Ombudsman Secretariat is the only institution in Pakistan which ensures that a decision is given out in a period of, in a matter of 60 days. So for the common man, it's a it's a breath of fresh air. You know, if they were to go to the court, 60 days would probably be their first step towards just having their case filed and maybe a first or second hearing. So here they get a final decision. And because this Ombudsman Secretariat employs, uh, primarily employs um, retired judicial officers and government officers. So these government officers and judicial officers are able to um, resolve at least 98% of the cases through mediation. Okay. So the method 
psychology is this that if you were to come to the ombudsman secretariat mm -hmm. um before one of the officers for a hearing and you have a complaint against um uh, say the the capital development authority okay right. the so what they're going to do is that they're going to get a representative of the CDA over there and they're going to have you over there. And you have a chance to um, uh, voice your complaint and discuss it. The paperwork has already been done and they have a chance to respond in front of the officer. So 98% of the time it gets resolved through mediation. So I would say it's superb. It's fantastic. We need more institutions like this in Pakistan. And there's no problem with regard to access, because it's one thing uh, having the case actually being floated by a member of the Wafaki Mothism or the federal ombudsman, but it's one thing having access to it. So you think there's no problem with access as far as the common citizen is concerned? There is absolutely no problem to access because the complaint can be in writing, the complaint can be an email, the complaint can be sent by a representative. If you can't make it, they will take you on a video call. If mm -hmm. you can't make it, they will take you on a telephone call. You can reach out from any part of the country and send a handwritten, paper-written complaint, and that's all. That's all that's required. Okay. So when so you have... A, yeah. Very friendly to the common person. That's excellent, because when you have the federal ombudsman model, and, you know, the reputation of the organization is intact, the dispensation of the justice uh, system is absolutely, you know, stellar in re that regard. So why don't you think... Uh, don't you think that that particular model should be replicated in all tiers of, uh, you know, dispensation of justice when you talk about the courts? Because Lots of complaints have been coming up. And let me point out to the uh, events after the no-confidence motion, uh, which uh, took place when uh, pri former Prime Minister Imran Khan was actually deposed from power. There was uh, a lot of discussion with regard to the role of the previous uh, Chief Justice and the Supreme Court with regard to, you could say, um, unilateral decision-making. And one of the MNAs, I remember, uh, from the Pakistan People's Party, he basically said that if you take a look at the amount of pending cases in the Supreme Court, I mean, it's absolutely remarkable. There have been cases which have been going on for five years, for six years, with no uh, resolution in sight. So the ombudsman actually acts as a very good example or a template that uh, maybe the other uh, judicial organs can actually follow. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. However, um, uh, I also cannot... Um you know, completely say that then uh, we, we, we can't dispute the importance of courts mm -hmm. because uh, the ombudsman deals with uh, the simplified cases. Now, a lot of litigation is very complex. A lot of litigation uh, requires evidence. A lot of litigation requires a high level of uh, evidence and witness stage and requires a lot more uh, deep analysis into the case uh, then the ombudsman is equipped to do so. Okay. So it, that institution has, has its limitations, but it is great because it handles a large uh, um, uh, quantity of litigation that that is simple. Those are simple problems that um, uh, uh, a common citizen of Pakistan is encountering, and they can be quickly resolved. So I do think that it, they, they, they needs to be sifting. The courts right. need to right. divert this kind of litigation to alternate dispute um, organizations. And the more complex litigation needs to be with the trained judiciary. So I think it needs to be handled in that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the recently concluded Econ Fest of 2023, which was held at the Pakistan-China Friendship Center here in Islamabad, I recall a prominent lawyer, uh, Babur Sattar, uh, actually making that point. Um, he basically said that, you know, the number of cases which are which the courts are actually flooded with, it's almost as if many judges and lawyers actually come out of the courts at uh, you know ridiculous, uh, sometimes at midnight, sometimes you know even beyond that because of the volume of cases. But do you think that's more to do with you could say backlog that's not being paid attention to, or is just the volume of cases that actually come to the courts? It's backlog. It's hundred percent backlog. Um, yes, um, like I said in the beginning of our discussion, in the in about the last five years, the volume has also increased. People are more aware. People are reaching out to the courts, so that has increased. But then the backlog is there, mm -hmm. and there's backlog of uh, of litigation of cases that actually can be resolved quickly. 
and there also needs to be more training with uh, i think the legal fraternity also needs to be to have a more regular training to be able to understand the difference between necessary and unnecessary litigation so there is a lot of unnecessary litigation also being advised to clients i see it all the time i mean i i have a lot of clients who come to me and uh, uh, it's always in the hands of the lawyer to advise them oh you can you know challenge this also in court or challenge that also some things are unnecessary sometimes you can still get justice without making a lot of unnecessary litigation so that needs to be reduced the lawyer community needs to be educated more the judiciary needs to um uh, sift and go through the cases and divert a certain section of the cases to other um uh, judicial institutes and let them handle that and they needs to be the and they need to another very important thing um as i'm saying it is uh, yeah, please, uh, me is uh, that there needs to be more more judges need to be hired so many many uh, seats of judges all over the districts uh in lahore in the big cities are vacant so uh, you must have been seeing this a lot in the newspapers as well yeah, there was a lot of talk about this in the last couple of years hiring is very slow recruitment of judges is very very slow uh, seats are vacant we are a huge country we cannot afford that uh, in a huge country you're going to have uh, uh, people with legal problems i always say that you will always need a lawyer and a doctor so you will always have sick people and you will always have people with uh, problems that, that that need to be resolved complaints that need to be resolved legal cases so you need to have a very robust legal uh, judicial system there and that judicial system is going to be dependent on um uh, very well trained and uh, good judges and how is that going to happen that can't happen with vacant seats right so we need more recruitment these are some of the things there are various issues but these are some of them that need to be resolved before you can get rid of this backlog and this backlog needs to be quickly uh, out of the system for uh, the judiciary to be strengthened as an institution right so so your experience with the icrc let's come to international humanitarian law now we talk about uh, you know asia is a continent which tends to be very dynamic and we all know what's happening uh, in gaza we won't touch upon that right now but you know if we take a look at the other disputes that are taking place i mean you talk about india's illegal annexation of jammu and kashmir which is called indian illegally occupied jammu and kashmir and then you have the nagorno karabakh uh, crisis between armenia and azerbaijan which has also resulted in casualties and then you have tensions in the south china sea you uh, you're well aware of the you know the human rights quagmire in afghanistan since the 2021 taliban takeover so many conflicts actually taking place uh, how do you see international the applicability of international humanitarian law Uh, in asia specifically i'll come to africa in a while but you know in asia specifically uh do you think it um, it's not applied universally do you think people will violate ihl uh wantonly or do you think it's a bit of both uh hamza i am going to be very truthful sure, so please, yes i worked with the icrc for uh, four years I am an expert in international humanitarian law from the Geneva Academy and I did that on a full scholarship so you can yeah. understand my passion for the yeah. subject. I will not lie to say that I am so hopeless. Uh and you said we would not touch upon the Gaza situation but it is uh, it's necessary to speak about that before I even comment on anything else. I think the humanitarian law machinery has failed. it does not exist it's a facade um because it it's it's applied uh, at at whims and wishes so if we feel if 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 countries feel like applying it they They'll apply apply. it yeah. if they don't feel like applying it they don't apply it although all of them are signatories they're all signatories it's part of their uh, um uh domestic laws uh pakistan is uh, uh you know when when you speak about uh, various conventions you know pakistan is a signatory to various conventions um in south asia a lot of countries are signatory to various international treaties and conventions but they are applied at whims and wishes uh look at the gaza situation i mean can you can you do you even feel that there is 
any humanitarian law or the or the word universality can be associated with humanitarian law anymore it's become such a mockery that i don't even know how to tie in the rules of humanitarian law with reality anymore how does one do that how does one justify anything at all um look at what's happening with the afghans in pakistan it's all i think it is all um it, it's not even laws it's all policy it's all a uh, crude and ruthless policy that is applied world over i don't think that uh, humanity the humanitarian law uh, and uh, human rights law universally actually exists i think these are just tools that governments are uh, picking up we we as students of the law have studied it we've spent many years i don't know whether wasted or not but i think they are uh, just pulled uh, by countries and governments uh, to use for their own benefit as and when they like okay no i i actually appreciate that may very i'm very happy with my answer but no, that no, is I'm a very no i'm actually very happy because answer. this is something that's um, been because... argued by many uh, prominent scholars uh, not only of international humanitarian law but also of international politics because the brand of neo realism and this ruthless you could say corporate elite which is actually dictating decision making is actually preventing or impeding uh you know human rights uh, protection it's as simple as that and we're talking about the corporate elite we're also talking about the intelligentsia we're talking about the establishment we're talking about so many different uh you could say tiers there are the Geneva convention i mean what are I, the, you were talking about the icrc the icrc is you know is is the custodian of the geneva conventions where are the geneva conventions today you know the first four geneva conventions civilians wounded and sick um uh, shipwrecked um uh, people who are no longer the the, the core right. of international humanitarian yeah. law says that do not attack those who have left the fighting or are no are not part of the fighting i mean what is happening today there is world over silence while children are slaughtered while hospitals are uh, are bombarded while civilians are uh, you know b- 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 killed left right and center the numbers are phenomenal where is you think the geneva conventions even exist oh, do you think they oh, even matter oh. i mean the entire world is sitting silently so what how else can we even speak of any other conflict how can we how can we apply international humanitarian law in such a um, in such a biased manner are our laws to be applied like that uh as a student of law and as a student of international humanitarian law i refuse i refuse to think that this law has any value any more it does not in my eyes it's it's been shattered over the last 55 days and and especially with the world silence if the world was not silent if the world was rooting for the geneva conventions if the world was rooting for ihl and saying that you know the people are i'm talking about governments i'm talking about the parliaments all over who voted this law in who made it their domestic legislation mm-hmm. if they were making noise i would say there's still some potential in the law but no i i honestly don't i i'm not hopeful anymore let's see maybe there's some turn of events something something big happens uh, but until that the world the parliaments in unison world over are able to say that international humanitarian law applies universally and you know it is also part of customary law yeah customary you will not kill right. women children and civilians in a time of conflict you will not bombard hospitals you will not bombard schools you will not deny uh basic necessities of food water um to the population who are not part of the fighting you will not allow illegal occupation whether it is kashmir or palestine until the world can say that until parliaments all over the world can say that um then uh, till that time what can uh, uh, a humble lawyer like myself say on the applicability of ihl that's my very uh, honest response to you 
No, I appreciate that. On And on that realistic note, Senior Advocate Siva Farooq, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I think it was enlightening. We got to know about the positives, the pros and cons of the judicial system within a country such as Pakistan, the ap applicability of the, the law within Pakistan and, you know, its applicability uh, regionally as well, as well as uh, how IHL is being openly flouted uh, considerably. And we can just hope for a better uh, world and a better future. So thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you so much, Hamza. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing you again soon. You're welcome. Likewise. So that's it from Islamabad today on Think Tech Hawaii. I was here, uh, you know, having this engaging discussion with Senior Advocate Sabah Farooq. Do provide us with your comments, feedback, everything on social media. Until next time, take care. Mm -hmm.